I've been enjoying working with Azure so far, but testing things can be quite expensive, unless you're familiar with the billing process and how much things cost right up front. Rather than risk a surprise at the end of the month, I'm going to turn my attention to creating a web application on Azure that's completely free, including the database. First, we need to make sure that we're using the right kind of service plan. Right now, I'm using the standard S1 app service plan to accommodate my Docker container, but there's also the F1 or free tier, which I can use, but, and this is critical, it doesn't support Linux just yet. This might change in the near future, but what this means for me is that I can't use Docker anymore because using Docker means that I need to use Linux, which if I can't, well, then I can't use Docker and nothing can be free. There are more details to discover, of course, but let's do that as we move forward. Here's the make file I've been using to push my Dockerized site to Azure. I like make a lot, and I show you how I build things with it in episode number five. As you can see here, I need to use a standard tier app service plan in order to use both Linux and Docker. That's not free. The problem is that I want this all to be free, part of the free tier F1, which means no more image from Docker Hub and a SKU reset to F1. I'll remove the image in the web app creation command and I'll also trim back the logging as I don't really need all these settings if it's a hosted web application. The last thing I'll do is to rename the app so I know what's going on, and I'll call it Velzy App Free with the resource group Velzy Free and the plan. Well, you can probably guess Velzy Plan Free. I don't have to do this, it just makes me feel better. Now that I'm deploying directly to Azure, I need to use deployment credentials. This was handled with Docker Hub using an authentication key that I set up through the portal, but I need to identify myself if I'm going to push directly to the app. I'll set my credentials here using the app name and a deploy suffix. For the password, I like to use passphrases as they're easy to remember and difficult to guess using brute force. Azure is going to be running this site for me, so I need to tell it how to do that. I won't be running on Linux, which means that a Windows virtual server in a container is going to be running my app. Now, I'm not used to using Windows as a remote Git repository. I usually use something like Linux, as most people do. But the good news is that this experience is actually seamless with Azure and a thing called Kudu, which I'll talk about in a bit. But how do we even know where to push? This, once again, is a job for the CLI help system. Here are the commands that I use to figure this all out. The very last one is telling me that I need to execute the config-local-git command. Doing that, I get a URL back. Examining the structure of this URL, then we can see that it's entirely guessable, given the information that we already have. We can build the hostname using the name of the app and adding a .scm, .azurewebsites.net, forward slash, whatever the name of my app is, .git. We're using basic authentication to log in, and since it's over HTTPS, it's secure, that means I can put my credentials right here in the URL before the hostname. But what do I put here? I can find that out by asking the CLI. There should be some kind of thing in there about runtimes. Well, there it is. AZ Web App List Runtimes. Since I'm using Node, I'll pick the latest runtime as of this recording, which is version 10.6, and I'll specify that right here in my runtime variable. Now that I have the runtime, it is time to tweak the Web App Create command. I need to specify the runtime here that I just chose, and I also need to tell it that I want to deploy my source using a git push. Now, I need to find out how to do this, so once again, I'll use AZ Web App Create with a help flag, and I'll look for an argument that specifies a git push or something like that. But hey, look at that. I hit paydirt right off the bat. At the very bottom here is an example command for deploying a site using Node and a git push. Hey, lucky me. I just need to add the argument dash dash deployment local git. Just for the sake of being complete, let's take a look at the other deployment options that use git. The one I'm using is the very first selection here. But I can go further and I can specify a specific branch if I want by using dash B. I can also set things up to pull from a remote Git repository like GitHub. Well, that's for another episode. For now, I'll copy and paste the example command right into my make file, resetting the runtime specification to use my shell variable. We are almost ready. I've set up my deploy user and deploy password variables, but now I need to tell Azure about them. To do that, I execute AZ Web App Deployment User Set and then pass in the username and password that I want to set. You might be wondering how I figured that out, and I think you know by now. I figured it out by using the CLI help system, which I think you probably should have the hang of by now, I hope. 
Once I've done that, I'll add the remote branch to my Git repository, which will use the Git deploy URL that I created previously. The final step is to create an actual deploy target in my makefile that will push my code up to Azure. This is a simple git push Azure master. All right, I'll reset the dependencies for each target so that I can orchestrate these commands properly. And we're done. Let's give it a try. I'll use my typical make or make rollback command and whoops. <laughs> Looks like I have a small error, which is, oh my goodness. Well, that's the perils of copy and paste, isn't it? I don't have a proper line continuation. Let's fix that. And oh man, another error. Well, the good thing about this is that my rollback target is called, which erases the entire resource group, which means I don't have any orphan resources. That makes me happy. While that's happening, I'll see if I can find the error. And there it is. I accidentally put deploy pass in my deployment URL instead of deploy password. Whoops. All right, let's execute this again. And skipping ahead a minute or so, it looks like it's working. Our git push went off just fine, and the post receive hook up on Azure is sending us back some interesting information. The most interesting of which is this line right here. Why is this so interesting? Hey, let's take a quick tangent. We already know we're deploying to Windows, but this just confirms it for us. The path specification is using backslashes and is referencing the D drive. The file structure is also fascinating to me. It looks like we are inside a Windows container with an attached D drive, which is a standard data drive for Windows servers. Basically, we have an entire Windows box at our disposal. <laughs> and it's free. I can also see that there's a thing called Kudu, which is running some kind of synchronization between the repository that I just pushed to and a place where my site is actually hosted called www.root. I'm going to dig into that in just a bit. Okay, back from our tangent, and look at that, our site pops up. This time, it's a lot faster than my previous experience with Linux containers. What's happening here? Why is this experience so much different? Okay, now let's find out a little bit more about Kudu. If you head over to the Azure portal, you'll see a non-descriptive link under Development Tools called Advanced Tools. See that K-looking icon there? Well, that's a K for Kudu. How do I know this? Well, the short answer is that I was having trouble one day and called Scott Hanselman, which is a fun thing that I can do because <laughs> I work at Microsoft again. And he said, oh, yeah, go check out Kudu. I bet you'll find the answer. Click on that link and you'll see this ever so helpful page. None of this says anything about Kudu. You just have to be persistent and, well, you kind of have to guess or ask Hanselman. Once you click on this link, you're taken to another login screen, which might seem a bit gratuitous on Azure's part, but there's a good reason for it. I'm going to talk about that in two seconds. I'm going to talk about this screen right now. This terrifically bland boilerplate bootstrap styled Kudu front end. What the heck is this? <laughs> it doesn't look like Azure at all, does it? Well, I'll provide a quick summary now, but we're going to dive into all of this stuff in another episode later on. And that quick summary is that Kudu is a project created by Microsoft that will receive a Git push and using a series of commands and a post receive hook while it synchronizes a live website with the updated changes from your Git repo. It also has a front end that tells you everything about what's happening in the background and all about your site. Now it's important to understand that Kudu is not Azure. It's an open source project created by Microsoft that is used by Azure. This distinction is an important one to make. It's why the website looks so different using Bootstrap and, well, it's a little bit uh, simple, isn't it? In fact, if you examine the URL, you can see that it's pointing to the same host as our remote Git repository. You can use Kudu anywhere. It doesn't have to run on Azure specifically. You can put Kudu on your own Windows server and have the exact same experience. So why do we care about this? Well, for a simple reason. It's super powerful information about your deployed site. We have access to environment information and a REST API that tells us everything we need to know about our deployed app. I've come to depend on Kudu so much that I've taken to creating a shortcut in my makefile using the target sense. I can open Kudu whenever I'm frustrated or confused by typing make sense in the command line. Get it? Get it? I'm so clever. One of my favorite tools is the command line tool, which uses a Unix emulator or PowerShell depending on what you're comfortable with. Right above the emulator is an HTML file tree, so you can see the entire tree of your deployment. This is crazy. I can click those links in the file tree, or I can navigate in the CLI below with the file tree synchronizing to whatever the present working directory, or PWD, is. 
Okay, we'll come back to this in just a bit. Right now, I want to see if I can create a file-based or embedded database on my live site that's free without worrying about any kind of overwrite. Up front, I know this is probably not the optimal solution for a production system, but if you're just testing things out for development or whatever, it's perfect because it's free. I'm going to use NEDB, which is kind of like SQLite for document databases. It emulates the MongoDB API, which means you can get rolling with a document system easily and graduate to MongoDB later on. Setting this thing up is easy. Just install it using NPM and declare what type of data store that you want. I'll choose an auto-loading persistent one, storing my data in a single file. I've added this code to my express index route, which you can see here. I want to store data right in the root of my application. Yeah, I know, danger, danger. So I'll create the directory called data and make sure to add it to my gitignore file so it doesn't get committed to my repository. Next, I've added a simple query to my index route and that just displays the data. I also have a post handler, which adds the data. I'm trying to keep this as simple as I possibly can because my goal is to see if I can use an embedded database without the fear of overriding it when I update my site. Let's test this out and see if it works locally. And it does. It's almost as if I practiced this stuff beforehand. Before I push the changes to Azure, let's see which files have changed locally. This is critical to me. I want to be sure that Kudu will only synchronize changed files, not completely overwrite the entire site. Now, these are the ones that I've changed, so let's push. My site has deployed and Kudu's post receive hook has taken over. I can see the same message I saw before, but this time only the changed files are synchronized. That is great. But we still need to know if we can create a directory in here in the root of our application and have it stay there between pushes. Refreshing the entire site after deployment, there's our new homepage. I'll add Burke to my friends list, though I don't know why. Don't tell him I did that. And it works. Let's add Emily too. Let's head back over to the Kudu command line tool. And hey, look at that. It's updated in the background. There's my data folder right there in the root of my site. If I click on it, I can see the JSON file that NADB uses for data storage. In fact, I can edit it directly if I'm feeling evil. Let's be sure this data will survive a full stop and restart. I'll use the CLI tool to do the start and stop, verifying that the app is completely stopped. It is. Now I'll restart it. And look at that, the data is still there. You can read more about how Kudu synchronizes files on the Kudu wiki page, but right here is the relevant line. Kudu is also smart enough to delete files that were removed from the repo while not deleting files that were created at runtime by the site. That's perfect. It's exactly what I want to see. Now I know what you're thinking. Rob, you're kind of crazy. I like crazy, but you're being a little bit too crazy. And I hear you. I'm not trying to tell you that this is a good idea for a production system, but it will do fine when testing things out if you don't want to pay any money, or if you just want to stage things for your client and show them what you're up to. In a later episode, we'll have a look at a better storage solution that's virtually free, removing the need to stress out about deleting your database from disk. As for now, that's it for me. Thank you so much for watching.